and welcome everybody. This is the Mind Sculptors gameplay series. I am your host, Callahan, and we've got another great show lined up for you guys today. Another great matchup between the Lab Maniacs and Into the North. Before we get into it, though, I just want to take a moment to thank you for joining us this week. If you like this episode or any of our other episodes, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below. If you want access to our Discord server, as well as some extra content, make sure to head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash themindsculptors, or check out the link in the description. Today, we are going to be having our second week of Lab Maniacs versus Into the North. And this week, we've got, again, Lab Maniac Dan. He is going to be playing Timna Krom this week, kind of an older list. Uh, we have Cobblepot playing Tevish Krom. We've got Spleenface again playing Kaikar and Sick Robot playing his iconic Veral's Hulk list. Joining me this week to uh, commentate over this uh, epic gameplay <laughs> uh, is my good friend Pongo. Pongo, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Awesome. Um, I, I, I said this, I was talking when I had Phoenix on last week and we were talking about uh, going into this. Uh, it was really crazy for the two of us um, to get to cover uh, a Lab Maniacs game uh, because the Lab Maniacs are a big part of how we got into it. So it's it's really cool to get to watch the Lab Maniacs uh, and really kind of come back into it just a little bit there with that game. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this one. I, I'm actually looking at Dan's playmat right now and it's funny because, I mean, I, I recognize a lot of the signatures there, but actually I see my, my doppelganger signature over in the bottom left. I'm gonna leave it to as an exercise for the viewer <laughs> to determine which one is my is my mine or my doppelgangers. But uh, yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Dan, he like we said in the opener, there is playing Tim Nacrom, and it's not what you would think of as kind of modern day Tim Nacrom, right? Uh, Pongo, what is this list doing? Yeah, so this looks a little bit closer to, um, like, sort of some of, like, the Timnacrom, like, man-style decks, although we're not really running any stacks pieces here. It's a bit closer to Opus Thief in a way, but, like, missing a few of those payoffs. You know, it's, like, something totally different, I guess you could say. Um, although not totally different if you're used to, like, a different era of CDH. Uh, a lot of these cards did see some play at... You know, some point. Uh, certainly a lot more play back in 2017, 2018. Um, but otherwise, you know, we've ported some of, like, the new technology into this deck. Dockside Extortionist is here. Thassa's Oracle is here. Um, you know, we're playing console lines. Um, but, uh, yeah, other than that, like, some, some, certainly some interesting inclusions. The cards that you haven't seen in some time, like uh, Hercules Recall. Yeah. Um, and Angel's Grace, which you don't see a whole lot of anymore. Yeah, I was going to say the the Hercules recall. I was like, man, outside of Joyra, I haven't seen that card get played in a long time. Yeah, I think it's been the last time I saw that card was like early 2017. So when when people play Hercules recall Pongo for people who might not be familiar, newer to CDH, what does Hercules recall do in a deck like this? So it achieves at least historically it achieved a couple of goals. Um, so the principal goal with this card was to like essentially use it as a ritual, um, to pick up a bunch of your mana rocks and then to replay them, you know, in particular your free mana rocks, uh, you know, when you're going off on a, um, ad nauseum line. Um, but in addition, you, it also kind of serves as a way to remove artifact stacks pieces. Um, so what was really big sort of back in the day and you see it less these days, although, you know, it's not totally totally uh, defunct or anything like that it's just less common is that people used to play a lot more like thorn of amethyst uh sphere of resistance winter orb stuff like that and it's a lot more common if you the, play with me yeah <laughs> <laughs> you still see them sometimes but it's it's certainly uh you know we, ha we have less of like a rock paper scissors meta where you know like you have the ad nauseum decks that get beaten up by like the hate bear style decks you know right. like 
back in the day we had like Jaleva and Zur and like they would frequently go up against Boon Weaver Carador and Boon Weaver Carador um, you know it, while it wasn't playing like all of those aforementioned tax effects um, you know instead playing like Thalia um, it you know it might occasionally also play a Winter Orb or something like that but you know you also saw other decks like Derevi and you also saw other decks like Yisan more often and they were playing things like Trinisphere right. and, and, and all the Thorn effects and stuff like that so it was really nice to have, you know, that sort of dual ritual slash uh, interaction piece. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also kind of playing a blast from the past, uh, Commander, his sick robot from Into the North. He's playing Viral's Hulk. And uh, it's, it's obviously on some new technology. But this deck, uh, this is some OG original Protean Hulk technology. So for some people who might not be familiar with this deck, um, what is this deck doing? I mean, it's it's playing some stuff that we might be familiar with, right? Uh, but what is it really doing at the end of the day? It's funny because I've known Sick, Sick Robot, for, for a long time. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he was very well known for this deck way back in the day. Um, also well known for, you know, other flavors of Hulk, um, you know, especially like Flash Hulk style decks in particular. Um, and I remember, you know, like essentially just like throwing out random um, Protean Hulk technology at like various points and like Sick would be like, whoa, yeah, like that, that works. Like, let's do that. Um, like Shuffle you know, Hulk. Remember that? <laughs> well, that one wasn't. Yeah, that one was somebody else. Uh, I yeah. can't take credit for that one. But, um, you know, some of like the Persist style stuff mm -hmm. um uh i'm trying to remember the name of the card but essentially it's like a it was a shadow i think it was a shadow more card it was like oh you're talking about the you're talking about the the um what's it? it's a it's a uh scarecrow that scarecrow card with wither right uh not quite um so no no this is actually a card that had persist uh it was safe safe hold elite that's the name of the card um, oh, okay. And essentially, it was just a two mana card with persist, and like, you know, back then um, we had essentially figured out that you could come out with a pile, come up with a, a persist pile using safe hold elite. Um, obviously, you needed to be in the right colors to do it, um, mm -hmm. and and you know that that was like tech for a little bit. But then later on, we got uh, lesser mastercor that was printed, and lesser mastercor uh, just kind of simplified Hulk piles. Um, um, by allowing for you to use Disciple of the Vault um, instead of using um, in, in, instead of using uh, sorry what's the name of the uh, the vampire that drains you drains a, a player for one when a creature dies um, so oh yeah I know what you're talking about are you talking about Blood Artist yes Blood Artist okay. exactly um, so so yeah exactly so instead of using Blood Artist now you get to use Disciple of the Vault which means that your entire Hulk pile fits into one Hulk trigger whereas before uh, you know you, you would often have to multi Hulk which would make you more vulnerable to like you know graveyard interaction or something like that at instant right. speed or removal something you know um, a few other sort of surfaces for attack whereas you know with everything being sort of compacted into one pile where you could also you know often you know if, if you're playing if you don't have to play around like graveyard hate for example you could include protection into your pile as well um that that really kind of streamlined the deck in a lot of respects and made mm -hmm. it a lot more resilient so it was not a revolutionary change for the deck it was kind of an evolutionary change for the deck but one that just kind of made it that much more resilient to various types mm -hmm. of interaction and if i'm not mistaken actually so i i do actually believe you can fit in protection into the standard pile um so so yeah exactly the, the pile became that much more resilient just because uh, you weren't multi-hulking and you had uh, right. protection sort well of if you i believe if you have viscerous here out your pile can just be masticor malira disciple of a vault and then sylvan safekeeper yeah, exactly. And and because we're talking about Varols, like in a lot of situations you are just gonna have the sack out loot in play. Right. So so that's how you essentially just get the the uh all, all the entire pile in one activation or one trigger of the Hulk and you just go from there with protection. Right. Now there is uh a particular what I could imagine is going is 
could be a Hulk pile. I don't know that it will ever be. Uh, but is Mara Long of the Morn Song an opposition agent? Um, and so this is kind of newer technology that has come out because of Commander Legends. Uh, but, you know, why play this over some other things? Um, so obviously this kind of gives you like a backup pile that you can uh, pile into. Um, you know, suppose you have a couple of pieces in hand and so that's making it hard for you to pull off your Hulk pile uh, in a timely fashion or perhaps something got exiled um, and you really needed that piece, which which can happen pretty often. There, there's, mm -hmm. you know, more exile removal in the format than there has been in the past. Um, essentially, yeah, having this backup pile is pretty powerful because one opposition agent is just a very, very powerful, insane card on its own. Uh, so you're happy to play that. And then obviously Marilyn of the Morn Song just as kind of like a one-off inclusion. Um, you know, it, it it's not the type of thing that you're going to play just kind of out there <laughs> because right. it does have some backfire potential. But, you know, if you have the combo already, then then it becomes very strong. You, you just have kind of a soft lock on the game. Uh, mm -hmm. If nobody has any removal in hand or any way to like kill you in a sort of hasty fashion, then you know that you can kind of upgrade that <laughs> into a fuller lock. Um, right. So yeah, it, it kind of puts the uh, it, it puts a lot of pressure on your opponents to be able to answer it with what they have in hand. Right. Now, uh, one thing that I did notice about this deck is it is playing Life Death. However, there is not a Razaketh in this list. So what is Life Death doing in here that kind of sets it, uh, is doing, because it's not doing the Razaketh thing, right? Right. But, um, so this deck, I think, just wants to play kind of like a, as much reanimation as it possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you have the sack outlet in your command zone. Um, you know, you're kind of just trying to cheat protein hulk into play like by any means possible mm -hmm. um so sometimes that's going to involve like entomb reanimate or like you know some kind of discard spell like a, a um like a cabal therapy on yourself or something like that you know or a, a final parting to put something into your graveyard essentially yeah like you're you're either cheating the hulk into play off of like a pattern of rebirth or a, um um sorry a natural order Mm -hmm. or essentially you're reanimating it. So I think it's it's largely to do with that. You know, you just want to play all those reanimation effects. Okay. That makes sense. Man, this is who just such... Who wants to pay seven? Right. <laughs> no one wants to pay seven for Hulk. This is just wild to look at this list. This is just stuff that I have not seen in a long time, and I'm so excited to see this get played. Uh, playing some newer stuff is Cobblepot. He is playing Tevish Krom. And this is about as standard as uh, current decks get, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking over the deck list as we speak. And for this one, um, you know, if you've seen a Turbo Nas deck before, uh, you know, there's there's nothing particularly strange about this one. Uh, you know, the only card that is like a little interesting, perhaps, is Jessica's Will. Just because you're playing the two five drop commanders, you don't have like something like Rograk for um, like consistent access to both modes of the spell mm -hmm. but like at minimum this card is still going to be a seething song sometimes just like not at minimum obviously it, it can be worse than that but like more often than not it's as good or better mm -hmm. um so so yeah it's it's not even that weird of an inclusion um yeah i think there's not a whole lot more to say about this one um you know it's got spring leaf drum in here which is like a bit interesting you know, porting a little bit of that tech from, uh, like, Rogue Rack style decks. Um, mm -hmm. Scroll Rack as well, which, you know, is kind of like an ad nauseum extender, so that one's kind of justifiable. Um, but for the most part, pretty standard stuff here. Right. Uh, and then finally, we've got Spleen Face, and he's playing Kaikar Winds Fury, uh, and this is the same Storm list he played last week. And uh, so for some of the people at home who might not uh, have seen this or might be unfamiliar, what exactly is this deck doing? Yeah, so I was looking over this deck for a little while, trying to make sure that I wasn't missing anything. Um, but for the most part, this kind of looks like, uh, you know, something of a classic manual storm deck where you're trying to build up kind of like a critical mass of resources, whether, you know, it's cards in hand or in the graveyard, uh, mana in the battlefield. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, you know, generating mana off of your commander because uh, whenever you cast a non-creature spell with Kaikar in play, you essentially you essentially get a red mana, um, or else you get you know some spirits that you can use later uh, for a variety of reasons or th- for a vari- for a variety of purposes. But um, no, for the most part, what this deck is trying to do is kind of play uh, a bit of like a stormy slash like control ish type of game with board wipes. Um, and yeah, and eventually is going to try to segue into kind of like an underworld breach line. Um, we're also using ice crown scepter here to make infinite mana off of dramatic reversal, mm-hmm. which can also mean infinite one ones. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty standard stuff here, but without necessarily having, um, like any of the, um, let's say black tutors and stuff like that to, to right. make the, the, the combo plan a little bit more consistent. Makes sense. Uh, well, as we go in here to look at the starting hands, our turn order is going to be Sick Robot going first, Lab Man Dan going second, Cobblepot in third, and Spleen Face is going last. Looking at opening hands, Spleen Face did keep his first seven. His first seven was an island, a snow-covered island, Chromox, Arcane Signet, Brawl Chief of Compliance, Frantic Search, and Wooded Foothills. So you're going fourth at the table. You keep your first seven. What do you think of this, Pongo? Um, so this is fine. Um, it's, it's not incredibly exciting, but I suppose, like, when you're dealing with uh, a deck like Kaikar, you know, where you don't necessarily have some of like those, you know, really, really big explosive plays like ad nauseum or something like that, you know, just being able to, um, accelerate out into like a turn two Kaikar and then potentially like cast a frantic search to improve the quality of your hand is like, you know, is, is going to be pretty good. So mm-hmm. I would expect to see some, you know, essentially an opening like that, uh, just a fast Kaikar and to hopefully find something a little bit better to do. Right. Yeah, it doesn't look like a lot on its face, but, you know, with a Baral and some other stuff, it might turn into something. Going uh, third, like we said, is Cobblepot. He had to mulligan down to six. His six was Misty Rainforest, Underground Sea, Mana Crypt, Lion's Eye Diamond, Mental Misstep, and Miscast. So you're going third, you're playing Tevish Krom, you keep your mulligan down to six. How do you feel about the six there, Pongo? I think at six, this is acceptable for this style of deck. Um, you know, a lot of the time you're going to keep kind of weird looking hands, but essentially what the hand is going to do is it's going to accelerate out into just a fast crom. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't actually be totally surprised to see, uh, you know, Cobblepot essentially ditching his entire hand <laughs> in right. hopes of like getting some new cards. Um, potentially casting Tevesh instead because uh, Tevesh is. Uh, very very powerful to get down yes. like super early onto an empty board mm-hmm. um, and depending on how cobble draws uh, you know this hand could potentially go bonkers relatively quickly as well um, and you know he might not necessarily need to take that plan either but uh, you know assuming he doesn't draw anything better than that I assume that's what we'll see absolutely going second here in the turn order is Dan he did keep his second seven uh, that seven was Enlightened Tutor, Talisman of Indulgence, Demonic Tutor, Cabal Ritual, Arid Mesa, Hollowed Fountain, and an Island. So you're going second in the turn order. You're playing, you know, this kind of old Timnacrom man deck. Uh, how do you feel about this seven? Oh, I feel quite good about this. Um, so you have like a nice mix of mana. I assume this Enlightened Tutor is going to go fetch something like a Mana Crypt. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we get to jam the talisman and then we've got a demonic tutor and a cabal ritual to try to find uh, like an ad nause. Um, I'd feel better, obviously, if I was doing this a turn earlier, like off of a piece of fast mana. Right. Um, But I think that this is probably good enough. Okay. Just given the fact that, you know, we have a couple of tutors and we have lands and this is not necessarily a deck that... uh, you know, needs to go ob- obscenely fast. It, it can also just kind of ramp into its its commanders as well and right. be totally fine with that as well. Going first is going to be Sick Robot. Uh, he did mulligan down to six. 
That six was Protean Hulk, Chromox, Reign of Filth, Wooded Foothills, Prismatic Vista, and Gaia's Cradle. So you're going first, you mold down down to six. Got your combo piece in hand. How do you feel about this? Uh, I don't feel great about this hand. <laughs> um, so the Protean Hulk in hand is, it, you know, it can be fine. It's a bit awkward, but here we don't really have any mana dorks, so Gaia's Cradle doesn't look particularly good. Uh, Chrome Mox, you know, that could imprint the Reign of Filth, but like... You know to what end we're not really Mm -hmm. doing anything with mana anyway at this point So in theory we could play a fast Hulk, but we you know sick really needs to draw into something better here Um, And the protein Hulk being in hand does shut off a few possibilities because you can Now you're no longer able to you know cheat it into play off of a natural order or cheat it into play off of a pattern of rebirth so you know those lines become a lot more awkward Um, Yeah, I'm a bit intrigued by this keep right you kind of need a cabal ritual uh or cabal uh, therapy to kind of get this out there uh into the graveyard yeah like i guess the thinking is that in theory you could like rain a filth into a Brodian hulk but mm-hmm. uh that seems much slower than what this deck is typically trying to do right well we will you will see how this all goes down for them we're gonna take a quick time out and we'll be right back on the other side this is the mind sculptors gameplay series And welcome everyone back. This is the Mind Sculptors Gameplay Series. I'm your host, Callahan. I'm joined again this week by Pongo. And we are taking a look at this Lab Maniacs versus the Into the North uh, series that we are doing. And going first is Sick Robot. And, you know, we were saying before we went to the break, uh, you don't really know how great you feel about this opener. So uh, for Sick... Uh, so if you were going to guess who's going to come out ahead here in these early turns, Pongo, who would you keep your eyes out on? Um, so I'm definitely looking at both Dan and Cobble. Um, they feel like they have sort of the more explosive openers and like the cleaner lines, whereas, uh, you know, both Sick and Spleen, you know, in, in their positions, it feels like they need to get a little bit lucky. But of course, you know, that can happen, right? Like, right. I think Sick does have some theoretically really powerful draws that he could get that allows him to just, like, jam out that Hulk really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and Morgan is going to have Kaikar down pretty quickly and then, uh, you know, be able to improve the quality of his hand as well. Right. So, you know, my main concern is that neither of them really has the tools to, to fight um, the two other players at the table. Um and in addition, you know, the two other players at the table don't really have the tools to stop each other because right. I expect Cobblepot is probably ditching his hand. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But um, yeah, I, I I expect this one to go pretty quickly one way or the other. But I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be Dan or Cobble who wins just because, you know, there's there's still a lot of stuff that there's still a lot of unknowns, a few draws that need to happen between right. now and, and the end of the game. Well, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Let's go ahead and jump in. There are no pregame effects, as we know. So Sick is going to draw for turn here. So what do you think uh, would be your lead here, Pongo? Possibly just a land pass. Uh, We'll see if maybe he drew something he can imprint. Okay. Okay. Chrome mocks. Life death. There you go. He drew a life death. And yeah, this seems fine. You definitely, like, would want to play the Chromox there just to potentially play around, like, a Mr. Chromora or something. Right. But but if, you know, your plan is to rain a filth out a Hulk, then it's certainly possible that you don't want to imprint that. <laughs> right. Let's see here. Arid Mesa is land for turn from Dan, and he passes. And we yeah, hear so Spleen Face. Spleen face over there is uh, laughing uh, in the game chat, saying this really is a 2019 throwback. Yeah. 
So let's see what Cobblepot does here. All right, playing Underground C. And he's also playing a Mana Crypt. Yeah, as expected. We'll see if we get the... Uh, huh? Oh, okay. Mystic so, Remora. Yeah, we drew a Mystic Remora, which uh, feels a little bit better than just dumping the hand there. <laughs> um, right. I assume Dan Enlightened Tutors in response? Uh, not entirely sure. It sounds like they're kind of mulling it over. Nope, they let it resolve. Oh. LED comes down. Do you ship the hand here, Ka or he's doing it? So this We're is coming a Teva show. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this makes sense too. We're just jamming out the Teva. We just have it all. <laughs> Jeez. Well, let's see how this goes. He discarded mental misstep, a misty rainforest, and a miscast. Uh, so. He's going to yeah, start so drawing cards next turn and probably this turn, too, as people try to develop their boards. The other option was to just sit on that fish and not commit Tevish to the board. But considering there's no pressure for Tevish right now, you're getting blockers down um, and you're just holding a bunch of interaction in hand and you're like a very proactive deck. I, I just mm -hmm. like jamming Tevish here and, and accruing value right out of the game. Yeah. And, the, and the Mystic Remora just makes it even more absurd. Right. Well, you know, especially you're playing a handful of like you're playing at least two slower decks uh, and, you know, Kaikar is not going to be nearly as explosive as you have the ability to. So, you know, trying to go that route doesn't seem awful. Yeah, I think Kaikar kind of has to feed your fish here, too. That's the really awkward part. I, I just don't imagine a scenario where you win if you don't, you know, try to get things going relatively quickly here. Yeah. Spleen is going to cast that Chromax. Chromox. Wow. Heard my Cleveland accent come out there for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Chromox from Spleen Face. We'll see what he imprints. And he's going to cast an Arcane Signet. And Cobblepot's already is. drawn two cards off of this te off of this Mystic Remora. So it seems like it's paying off. So do we know what Morgan imprinted? He, it's a good question. I do, don't know what he imprinted. Uh-oh. That might be a GRV. Um, in Spleen's defense, he is coming off of, uh, this This record was recorded the day that he was coming off of uh, playing the Tier 1 tournament that morning and had was running on maybe an hour or two of sleep. Yeah, Chromox is a lot better when it's literally <laughs> just a, you know, Mox Sapphire. We will see if they notice it. I'm not entirely sure if they do or not. Uh, that might be an asterisk next to this, but we will see. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, he, he discard the exiles the Brawl. That's, that's as I expected. There you go. So, uh, Spleen, or excuse me, Sick did get an overgrown tomb off of that wooded foothills, and he is going to go to his second turn here. You know, if I'm in Spleen's position there, I might pretend to be, like, deliberating, being like, I know it's one of these two blue cards, but, like, right. I don't know which of these two, and then you just say, like, oh, you know, I think I actually need to hold up interaction here, so it's going to be this Baral, and then you're just bluffing that you have one mana interaction. Right. I don't know that he did that because we can't hear exactly what he said right now. But, right. Uh, you know, theoretically, that's something he could have done. So here we've got Sick playing uh, Varals. And yeah, this is kind of as expected. Varals is really good as a Hulk commander. Just having that, having that, you know, sack outlet in the command zone is just so strong. Yeah, and uh, he's going to have a lot of mana next turn. So, Lab, or Dan did uh, Enlightened Tutor on end step. He is uh, skidding the land for it at the moment. Uh, and he is going to 
you know, feed this Mystic Remora. So this Remora has drawn Cobble three cards already, in a, and you haven't even finished a turn cycle, and uh, he's presumably going to draw two more cards next turn. So do you yeah, he's do you do you pay here. for this fish here on this turn? It really depends on uh, you know theoretically what you've drawn into, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know his hand could be a lot of air still, in which case I would be pretty happy to pay for the fish. But it's also entirely possible that he's got a clear line to victory, and it's time to let that fish go and just you know try to win. Right. Well, Dan does tutor up a Mox Diamond. And he's going to put that. So what is left in his hand? He played Enlightened Tutor. He fetched. Uh, so Dan's got left in his hand a Talisman of Indulgence, Demonic Tutor, Cabal Ritual, uh, Hollowed Fountain, and an Island left. Yeah, so he's valuing the colored mana here off the Mox Diamond rather than going for something like a uh, a Mana Crypt. You know, he has enough lands in hand where it, that's fine. He can definitely just drop a land. Right. But I don't know. I mean, I sort so, of feel like I would have preferred to have the Mana Crypt there. So we've got a scrub land here from Dan. And uh, let's see what he does on his turn here. He might just be trying to develop his board more. Uh so it's very interesting to see the board dynamic. You've got, you know, a hand, two players here who really don't have an option to not feed the fish, right? Right. So let's see what he goes. He goes to draws the Mox Diamond for his turn. So let's see what he does. He plays an island for turn. That beautiful original Zendikar full art island. And let's see what he does. Mox okay. Diamond as a land for turn. Not paying for the fish discarding a wooded foothills and that's not a proxy boys and girls that is a real live expedition <laughs> so we picked up a wooded foothills at some point we've got a talisman of indulgence i i feel like demonic ooh, tutor here there's just a very very real chance that cobblepot untaps and wins here i mean he's drawn one two three four five six car he has a brand new hand going into his next turn yeah And, you know, this is the power of Mystic Remora for you. Yeah, absolutely. But it really helps, uh, you know, if you're combining that with something like a Mana Crypt, because, um, you know, in theory, your opponents could respect the fish by, like, delaying, essentially, like, getting time walked. Um, right. But when you have that Mana Crypt to go with it, it it's just, it costs you too much tempo to wait. So you just kind of, like, have to feed have it. To, yeah. Otherwise, you're just, you're, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And it looks like Cobble is going to not take damage to his Mana Crypt. Look at Cobblepot not taking damage off a of Mana Crypt. It can happen. And he is going to pay one for that fish. It'll be interesting to see if the other players get another turn here. <laughs> It's not out of the question because Cobble is dealing with not that much mana currently. He does only, yeah, he has one available mana to him at the moment. And he's going to plus one, draw two more cards off of the Tevish. Man, Tevish is such a good card. I remember when we were d doing our Commander Legends set review, we didn't even consider talking about this card. Um... <laughs> Did we not? I, I, I remember mentioning it as my, my Planeswalker of the year. No, no, no. In our set review for oh, Commander Legends. Review. Yeah, that's this, fair. I think uh, a lot of us uh, glossed over it at first. And then when we saw it in action, you know, even just the first time we were like, oh, OK, you know what? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. We were wrong. I think yeah, that, for Cobble, that the with five drop cards. 
Well, the moment I, I noticed people really started playing it, paying more attention to it after Rebel uh, built her Tevish Chrome list. And then I saw people's eyes kind of light up and go, oh, oh, oh OK. <laughs> yeah, I, so that was certainly, um, you know, one thing I think that did it. And probably that brought it into a wider consciousness for a lot of people. But I think I just like saw it in action one time and I was like, man, like it, it's true. Like this deck is already playing a five drop. Like it's fine to just have another five drop in the command zone. And this right. one, like it's so sticky like it just goes up uh in loyalty on both of its abilities like it generates solid like two blockers like a solid defense when it comes down you know it addresses all the issues that commanders have or or uh, planeswalkers have in commander right um, which is to say that it's it's very hard to remove um but it also generates a lot of card advantage and a lot of material so like it's just you know everything you would want for from this type of deck so like when you actually see it in action, you know, you realize all of those facets. It's it's so wild. Uh here as Cobble goes to his turn, he's gonna cast a dock side and oh boy. Okay. Well <laughs> this one's signaling the end. So that's gonna make five. I count five. Hey, so remember when we were arguing about uh, Bring to Light and Ad Nauseum? <laughs> Look yeah. at that beautiful Bring to Light off of, or of Ad Nauseum off of a Bring to Light. I mean, this is a non-green deck, so I don't know about that well, one. Well, yeah, but still, like, this, obviously we don't need to get into it right here at this moment, but I'm going to, going to say it just a little bit. This does, at the very least, show it's... It's not impossible to make no, five colored impossible. mana. It, it's just, you know, it, it, it's a little bit, I would say, um, not not exactly like rigorous methodology to like, like have the example in front of you and say, this is how it goes in most situations. <laughs> right. When like in a lot no, of situations, fair. you're tutoring for a mana crypt um, I and mean, you have like a dark ritual into your right. adenals and like that's how you're accelerating it into play man the card advantage on cobble's side of the board he's casting a crom now jeez so we're not winning we are just delaying everyone's misery or i have to be honest it bothers me misery. it bothers me to no end that he does not have his creatures in front of his enchantments and planeswalkers he has his Go or well, it's his. Uh, what's that? Is uh, what's <laughs> the thrall? I think thrall. Yeah. And his dock side, all in the that back, and he has Chrom out front. It just, it. You know what? I'll say this. At least he doesn't have his lands in front. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely a very interesting board positioning. <laughs> You've got creature enchantment, planeswalker, creature treasures, <laughs> and then Chrom out in front. There's, I, I don't know that there's a rhyme or reason to this. <laughs> I think it's just he's playing it where there's open spots. Yeah. <laughs> the treasures aren't with Dockside, right? Because I, I could imagine a world where you put the treasures next to Dockside and then you've got right. Mr. Promora and then you've got Tevish and then you've got the Thralls. You know, See, that, that kind of makes some sense to me. Right. The way I usually lay out my board is it'll be like, you know, like creatures you know uh lands sort them by effects those sorts of things that's generally what i do we're getting a windswept heath here for spleen face and presumably this is gonna get a red source yeah um i don't know if he wants to get a plateau here in theory, he could be going to get a Tundra because uh, he definitely wants to have a lot of islands in play. It's true. Uh, for his Mystic Sanctuary type lines. And he's already got the Arcane Signet that generates red. So, yeah, exactly. Right. There it goes. So, he is getting a Tundra and he's playing Kaikar. Uh, so, that is going to be his turn. Did not feed the fish, thankfully. Um, don't think you need to give Cobblepot any more fuel. Guy's Cradle is land for turn for Sick Robot. Let's see what he is going to cast. And he is playing Golgari Thug. 
All right. So what what does this do for you in this situation? Um, so I think just having it in play is good because of the uh, guy's cradle, naturally. Right. You know, you, you at minimum have that as a ritual. Uh, but then in addition, Golgari Thug, um, you know, it, it can be useful if you need to, like, discard a card to a body snatcher, for example, mm-hmm. to get it back into your deck if you're doing, like, a multi-hulk type pile. So, you know, it, it, it opens up uh, certain lines of play. And, and just having it in play, uh, you know, helps mitigate against certain bad draws. Oh, okay. <laughs> we, oh. we just have uh, an ad nose <laughs> off the top here. So let's see what goes down here. Holy cow. Sudan so was sandbagging a, an Adnaz, it looks. Well, he might have just drawn into that, right? Like, that's true. He might have just talked like this that. turn. And that's is that just happening? Uh, it looks like it's just happening. He's rolling his sleeves up here. So he gets a Bloodstained Mire, Hercules Recall, Vandal Blast, Preordain, Swords. Uh, dark ritual, painful truths, get pro. That one hurts. Yeah, fluster storm. Hey, right. <laughs> lightning bolt, dockside. All right, that's a good one. And that's so a lab jace. We are missing a braid. A little bit more fast mana. Yeah, there's no fast mana so far. Praetor's Grasp, Pact, Night's Whisper, Rakdos Charm, Talisman of Dominance, Tainted Pact. He's down to four. Notion <laughs> Thief, so he just dies. He yeah. got nothing off of that ad nauseum. Wow. If he got any amount of fast mana, that could have been a turn. Yeah, that was a bit unfortunate. I mean, I've had main phase ad nauses with zero mana uh, left floating in, in Najila that, that were better than that. Wow. Well, Dan just went out swinging. Uh, so it is going to go over to Cobblepot's turn here. And there is a decent chance that Cobblepot just wins here. Yeah, well, he certainly doesn't have to worry that much about interaction <laughs> anymore. Yeah. It's very so, possible that Cobblepot, you know, just made the heads up play of, of like, letting that go through, knowing that, you know, it, assuming he knew Dan's deck very well, knowing mm-hmm. that it probably what didn't have the best main phase ad nauseum in the world. Oh, so we are playing risky, this Mystic but, Remora. So we're keeping the Remora around. And he is going to sack a Thrall, draw two cards. Let's see what he gets. He's got access to four, five, six, seven mana. Yeah, you have to kind of wonder what he drew into. If it was an right. interaction for something like an Adnog. He, he has to have... A lot of cards in hand. I can't... I've kind of lost track. He plays an Ancient yeah. Tomb. Jeez. What are we getting here? Maybe a Talisman? Grim Monolith. Grim Monolith. Okay. Right. So we're just making mana out here, I see. You know, as somebody who went land uh, LED Mana Crypt and just shipped his hand, this he, he's got a lot of mana. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, it certainly helps to draw a whole new hand after <laughs> that happens. Yeah, no kidding. The Mystic Remora off the top really just, uh, like, made that entire line, right. I would say, that much better and, like, that much safer. I feel like Cobble's chances, like, wouldn't actually be that spectacular if it was just, like, jam Tevish and have nothing. Right. But, but you know, jam Tevish also have, like, a new six-card hand. Wish Claw <laughs> Talisman, he's got one floating, and he should be able to just go get an Adnaz and win. Yeah, he's got the ad he's got enough mana for Adnaz here, there's no doubt about that. He's giving Reed the Wish Claw Talisman. Which makes sense. Yeah. So let's see 
where it goes here. Uh, for those who uh, were watching last week, Reed did win that first game on Cole. Um, and it looks like the Lab Maniacs are going to tie up the series here. So we'll have to uh, get them in a tiebreaker at some point. All right, let's see it. Pure into let's the abyss. see Add what models. we get. Oh, pure into the abyss would be hot. <laughs> At 38 life, I just would prefer to add nose here yeah. most of the time. Oh, it looks like we might be He's doing. doing pure. You know, Cobble does love pure. So instead of add nose, we're getting pure into the abyss. So let's see how this goes. He's kind of counting how many cards he's got out right now so that he can do yeah, the math. Yeah, the main math. advantage to Nas here is not having to do this math and, and getting there anyway. Right. <laughs> so let's see what he... How many... I'm not trying... I, I, I can't do math. Um, yeah. So... He is going to be trying to resolve this peer into the abyss, and he'll go down to uh, half of his life total. Uh, yeah, I can't be bothered. 19. 19 life, okay. Um, so the it other looks... issue with peer here is, you know, theoretically, Morgan has, like, a deflecting swat, but I have to imagine Cobble has protection, but still. Right. You know, it's one extra theoretical piece that you'd have to fight through. Right. So let's see. He drew half of his deck. So let's see what how this goes. Just kind of waiting for him to assess um, all the cards in his hand. Um, we're hearing here in the headset uh, the conversation between Dan is, is going, Pure into the Abyss seems like a really good magic card, and Spleen uh, is disagreeing <laughs> with him. So, so what is, you know, Morgan's issue with Pure into the Abyss? You'd have to take that up with him. I, I <laughs> mean, my understanding is that he doesn't like it because it's seven mana. I don't know. You know, this is a deck that is, like, almost... I want to say like 60% mana, so I don't know, mm -hmm. 7 mana is uh, an amount that you hit pretty often. Right. So let's see, what is he casting here? Thassa's Oracle, and I'm assuming Demonic Consultation, there it is. And it looks like nobody has interaction, and that is the game, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so, Cobblepot ties the series up one-to-one. -one. Unfortunately, they didn't play a third game, so we'll have to get that rematch uh, lined up there, Pongo. But, so, you know, looking at this game, you know, what were your, what do you think the turning point is, and what could have the table done to maybe, you know, not have this happen? Um, man, it's, it's tough because as soon as that Mystic Remora comes down and there's also a Tevesh Sot and a Mana Crypt, like, you're kind of forced into this position of needing to feed the fish, um, because you're going to just fall behind anyway, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's not like everyone's getting time walk. Those are the, the situations where you can, like, afford to pass on it. Um, you know, Dan had a fine hand but not necessarily a hand that was like quite fast enough although you know to some extent uh, I, I think that might be because his deck is hoping for there to be another like interactive deck at the table mm -hmm. um, it, which there is uh, you know Morgan is there but Morgan going last means that you can't necessarily count on him to be able to uh, play that role for you um, or to back you up in playing that role but you know for the most part you're just kind of getting buried in uh you know, Cobble's explosive opener. And I think Reed's opener was just like a little too slow. Uh, I think he really wanted to mulligan a bit more aggressively and to try to have like a turn three win there as opposed to like a turn four. Yeah. Uh, it was certainly an interesting game and it was honestly really uh, great to 
see, you know, everybody's uh, decks. It was great to see Dan back in action. I know he's uh, come out of retirement and played with our uh, friend Nathan Jones a couple of times. Uh, but it's great to great to see him back out there, and uh, we love the Lab Maniacs and uh, what they do. So, or well, what they did, I suppose. Um, so, uh, with that, uh, that about wraps things us up for us here today. Uh, and just a quick reminder that you can follow us on Twitter at the Sculpty Boys, or you can find a direct link in our link tree down below in the description. Want to also give an extra thanks and shout out to all our patrons who help keep the lights on. If you too would like to become a patron, you can head on over to patreon.com slash the mind sculptors or check out the link in the description. Thank you again for joining us and thank you Pongo for sitting down and commentating over this game with me. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Uh, I'm Callahan and see you next time. <laughs>